Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna take a look at an Amiga 500. And no, it's not the Amiga 500 that's in this box right here. It's this Amiga 500 here. Yep, it's a deconstructed Amiga 500. And I have no idea if this thing works. So in this video, we're gonna to try to figure out if it does and maybe fix it if it's not. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Let's take a closer look at this, shall we call it, art project. You might be wondering, where exactly did I get a thing such as this? Well, a few weeks ago, I was up in Seattle attending the Interim Computer Festival, and I ran into a viewer named Bill who had found this at a garage sale, if I remember the story correctly, and it was a mere $2. Now, when Bill picked this up, there was no explanation of, well, who created this and why? And we can take a look at the components here. We obviously have an Amiga 500 motherboard right here, the Amiga 500 floppy drive, which normally sits right there. We have the Amiga 500 keyboard. We have a random PCB, which not even sure what this is. We're gonna have to take a closer look at that. We have an Amiga mouse that's missing its top cover. And lastly, we have this interface card right here, which is a SCSI card with RAM expansion designed to go into a Zorro 2 slot. So that would be for the Amiga 2000 through the 4000. So the fact that we have Amiga 500 components here and here, and we have Amiga 2000 components here would imply that the person who created this was an Amiga fan or had access to lots of Amiga parts and thought that, well, this would be a fun little art project. Now, what's actually cool about all of this is the motherboard appears to be in really good shape. It has all of its custom chips here. It's just a regular 512K model. It's a little bit hard to see if the expansion connector here has corrosion on it, which typically comes from the RAM expansion card since the floppy drive is covering it, but I'm not seeing any evidence of corrosion, which would imply that this thing was deconstructed before the battery leaked on the RAM expansion card. If you notice up here, we are missing the shrouds from some of these D-sub connectors. These are the joystick ports or the mouse port and the joystick port. And I think this is the serial port, or maybe it's the parallel port. Either way, I think this is a DB25. And that means that I can probably find the nine pin shrouds for these and the DB25 one for this one. It would be the video connector here and the disk drive connector, which are the non-standard sizes that would be much harder to find. Now, besides the thing looking cool, you might be wondering, what am exactly am I gonna do with these parts? It turns out that I happen to have another project for a future video where the motherboard, but specifically the disk drive and the keyboard are gonna be potentially very useful for that upcoming video. I'm not gonna give any spoilers to what that video is gonna be about, but hopefully if these things are working well, well, I'll be able to finish up that video and you'll see it on the channel soon enough. Now flipping this thing around, you'll see that this is just a regular cork board and then it has some wire here, like hanger wire or something that was used to attach those parts to the motherboard. And the funny thing is these are actually relatively sharp the way they were cut. And while I was handling this thing after Bill gave it to me up in Seattle, I ended up spearing my hand with one of these sharp things. And at the Interim Computer Festival, I had a bunch of bleeding happening on my hand, which was less than ideal. So I think the first thing to do is to just try to bend these back and then start to extricate these parts so we can get to some testing. And in the process of removing these components, I need to make sure I don't stick my hand. Now with the floppy drive disconnected, I'm noticing here that, um, well, oh, hot glue. Okay, some of this stuff was attached with hot glue. Not a big deal. Hopefully when the previous person wired these things up with these metal ties here, they didn't damage any of the parts. But the disk drive, oh, the disk drive is missing its top cover. That's unfortunate. Okay, I'm not gonna bore you with the rest of the details about getting these metal things off, so I'm just gonna do a jump cut when it's all done. As you can see, I extricated all the parts. Some are a little worse for wear, like this mouse. Let's go take a look at this stuff on the bench. And here it is, the deconstructed $2 Amiga with the price tag still on the keyboard laid bare on the bench. There were quite a good number of these very sharp metal bits here uh, that were holding this stuff all onto the cork board, but it's all free and I'm pretty sure no additional holes were drilled in anything to put these things on. They were all pre-existing holes that were used. Let's start by looking at this interesting thing here. I'm pretty sure this is just a regular telephone. There is a phone jack there, it looks like an RJ11, a speaker with three wires, one of which is disconnected. And this definitely looks like a keypad, one through nine, zero, and star, and it looks like an extra button over here for whatever reason. And this PCB here has a big old crack in it, which is very typical for these types of PCBs. 
If you somehow recognize this of what it comes from, well, put a comment down below, but it's really inconsequential because this is basically just e-waste. Let's move our attention to this poor mouse. It's had its tail cut off, AKA the wire. It does look to be in okay shape. Otherwise there's a bunch of hot glue that's stuck on here. Looking at this a little closer, I'm not sure this is actually hot glue because I was gonna say you could use some 99% IPA to try to get it off. Hot glue comes off very easily if you spread it with uh, IPA, but I don't think that's gonna be the case with this. Nope, that is very permanently affixed onto there, which means that the mouse ball is captured, although, oh, no, <laughs> there it is, it came right out. But it does kind of mean, unfortunately, this mouse is not particularly useful, although this PCB still is. So we may as well extricate that because those buttons might be good. You just need to remove these two screws that hold it down. And I think this whole assembly should come out. And might as well just leave the cable connected. This part here, unfortunately, not usable. But this part, good parts. Moving our attention to the floppy drives. As I mentioned, the cover is missing. Don't really know why they removed the cover because it was mounted to the board upside down. On first appearance, everything seems to be intact here. I don't think anything is out of the ordinary. Let's try inserting the disc here. Goes down properly. Yeah, I'm gonna say that this thing may work. Next up, we have this, this SCSI slash RAM expansion card for the Amiga 2000. We zoom in right here, it says, Great Valley Products Incorporated, A2000 HC Plus 8 Series 2 Rev 2. And I'm not sure how well this comes across, but it says 1992 GVP version 4.5 for the ROM. And in case you're not super familiar with the way hard drive expansions worked on the Amiga 2000, this was a very typical arrangement, and Commodore themselves did something very similar. The idea is you take a hard drive and you mount it directly onto the PCB. Now, a lot of times in the back, there was some kind of a metal plate or bracket to strengthen the whole thing because, because it's a little bit floppy with a hard drive mounted on there like that. But you'd have a short little SCSI cable that just goes from that to right here. And then the power cable, which actually takes bus power directly from the Zorro bus, would power your hard drive. This particular card has up to eight megabytes of RAM expansion right on board. The Amiga hardware database will give us all we need to know about this particular hard drive controller card. Here it is, the Impact A2000 HD Plus 8 Series 2. It does say right here that it's a SCSI 2 DMA controller. So this should be a pretty quick SCSI controller for the Amiga 2000. The photographs of the card here don't show any kind of brackets or metal plate on the back, so I guess we just rely on the strength of the PCB to hold the hard drive. It's not great if you're shipping the computer with a hard drive attached. It does have a standard 25-pin SCSI connector on the back, same pinout as the Macintosh, so you can just opt for an external hard drive if you so desire. Some of you might have noticed here that I guess the person who was building this thing up decided to bend the bracket here, which is not that big of a deal. Metal is pretty flexible, so we should be able to bend this back here. I'll probably have to take this over to the vise to give it a little hammering just to get it completely back into shape. Back on the Amiga database, there's the manual that's been scanned and we have the driver disc, which is pretty awesome. I gotta say this website, pretty great when it comes to Amiga hardware and the drivers and the manuals. All right, let's focus our attention back on the motherboard. This thing is in well, really good shape. I see absolutely no corrosion whatsoever along the expansion slot here. We just have a few bent pins, which is nothing. We can fix that in an instant. As denoted right here, we have an Amiga 500 Rev 5. Here's the Kickstart ROM on this particular computer. I just looked it up and it is version 1.3, which I'll just write on there. This I see here is the Agnes chip and this is the original OCS Fat Agnes chip. So it can address up to one megabyte of RAM, both via the onboard RAM right here and the expansion connector right here. But unfortunately, because this is an OCS chip and not ECS or enhanced chipset, it can only support 512K of chip memory, which is the RAM that's used for graphics and sound. The later ECS parts are labeled 8372A, and that is the ECS or enhanced version of the Fat Agnes. The rest of the chips on here look correct. We have two 8520s. These are interface adapters for the floppy drive, parallel serial, stuff like that. And then we have this IC here, the 5719, which is the Gary IC. As far as I'm aware, that's kind of like the PLA for the Commodore 64, but the Amiga version of it. And then we have the Paula and the Denise chips. Now I'm kind of forgetting exactly what does what. Pretty sure that Denise handles the graphics, hence the fact that it's right by the hybrid right here and the video RGB output pin. And then if I recall correctly, Paula handles the floppy drive and the sound output plus some other fanciness. And really all we have left is the 68,000 CPU, eight megahertz, runs at like seven and change, 512K of RAM. We have some bus transceivers and a little bit of logic here and there. 
Now, the reason why the shrouds are missing from these three ports is because the nuts that normally hold these ports down to the RF shield, which is good for strength, but also, I guess, grounding and RF, whatever. Once you remove those and you take the RF shield away, then the shrouds can come off pretty easily. But lucky for me, I have some scrap Amiga 2000 motherboards that had some serious damage done to them, and they still have these shrouds on there. So I can just go steal those off that motherboard, and we should be good to go. Before we power on the computer, let's just take a look at this keyboard. Looks like it's in pretty good shape. There is some shininess to some of the keys, so I'd say this thing got a lot of use, plus there's some yellowing. We have a little bit of the glue on the board right here. Hopefully that doesn't cause any issues. This is a regular Mitsumi version, which does have a membrane that connects right here and goes underneath this base plate here. All right, so we have a little bit of archeology span going on here. And I have to say, I kind of love this stuff. Like why was this thing put up on that board? Was it just the Amiga had no value anymore and it was end of life, so they mounted it to that cork board? Or was it broken? And they decided to do that as a project just to get away from this broken hardware. Either way, let's hook up the power to this thing. And if it doesn't work, I'm sure I can repair it. When you're testing something like an Amiga, I recommend you just use the composite video output. It's just a little bit easier to rule out some issues with like your scan converter or your RGB monitor. Pretty much rule out a lot of problems with the composite video output because it's so ubiquitous and it should just work. Keep in mind though, on the Amiga 500 and the 2000, the video output from the composite jack is black and white. So any of the color coding we're gonna get from the Kickstart ROM, if there are problems with the RAM or other chipsets or whatever, we're not gonna be able to tell what color that is. And if we see flashing screen, we don't see the normal Kickstart screen, well then I'm gonna need to plug an RGB monitor to look at the colors. So the blue box you see on screen there is the RetroTINK. I have a power supply connected up. This is a third party one, which I know works really well. So let's turn this on. We're not getting anything at all. What I should probably do though is power cycle the retro tank, because I have had issues with that, where it just decides to not display any video at all. And I'm just gonna change it back to composite there after power cycling it. And let's try this again. Okay, that's more like it. Oh, okay, good, we're getting a white screen. That's a good sign, everyone. Good sign, this thing just might work. It just <laughs> it might be fully functional. It's probably trying to access the floppy drive, so we're waiting for the kickstart or the workbench disk screen. Ah, we got some corruption, but we do have the disc hand. I've never seen it like this, where it doesn't say workbench inside of the floppy label there. Very, very interesting. Now, what's surprising to me is the Amiga does do a rudimentary RAM check when you first power it up. And typically, if there's a problem with the chip memory, which is all of the RAM on the motherboard here, we're gonna get like some kind of a flashing screen to indicate that problem. Now that's where I was talking about the color flashing, which we can't see obviously because we only have monochrome video here, but we're looking at the correct disc icon there and yet it doesn't say workbench. So let's just power cycle this. Let's see what happens now on this power cycle. Okay, gray to white, totally normal. Oh, well that's so strange. Now it's fine, that was clearly not a pro Ah, oh, look at that, it just crashed. So I was bending and, and stretching this thing. And look, it's kind of coming and going. My suspicion here is the Agnes chip, which is really the linchpin of the Amiga. This thing does so much. These sockets can get flaky over time. And I've had some videos in the past where it seemed like the problems on the machine were completely random and weird. And it really just turned out to be the Agnes chip in the socket, like bad connections. So I'm gonna use this thing here. We're gonna pull this out and I'm gonna put some deoxid in that socket. So with these tools in here, you sort of push it in there and wobble the chip out. There it is, came right out without too much trouble. Use some magnification to look at all the pins in the socket, make sure they're all looking good, and also look at the chip. And these right there do not look super happy, so I may need to try to correct those. Hmm, those don't look great either, nor do those. What I'm doing here is I'm just using this little pick tool. I'm just bending these pins out. Some of them are pushed in quite a bit. And this one on the corner here is very mangled. I don't really know how this happened. Okay, so the pins all look a little straighter and they're pushed out a little further now, which means they should go in a bit better. Now, this scratch on the top here, I didn't cause that. This tool does a pretty good job of getting it out. Someone previously did. So that's pretty chewed up there. But we saw that the system was working. So I'm gonna say hopefully with some deoxid we should be in business. Now for applying deoxid, I have these little dropper bottles here and there's only a little bit left in here, but that's all you really need just to target the deoxid right onto the pins because that's where we want it. Just 
to put it in this little dropper, all I do is I simply spray some of the spray bottle into it and that's it. That's all it really takes. There we go. There's a notch in the socket and there's a notch in the package there. I think this is the correct orientation. And we just push it back down in like that. And I think <laughs> we're gonna try powering it on. Hopefully that fixes things. Alrighty, I'm flipping the power switch on the power supply. So far so good. Okay, that's excellent. Let's tweak the board here like I was doing. Okay, that seems a lot better. I'm thinking we're in better shape now than we definitely were. We were having issues before, having issues. Well, let's try to test out the floppy drive. I don't 100% remember if the Amiga drive needs a twist or not. I know on the 2000, there is a twist, but that has two internal disk drives. I think on the 500, you just use a straight through cable. So we're just gonna use this connector to this connector. Hopefully that does the trick. I can never remember how to hook up the ribbon cable and the four pin power connector for the floppy drive on the Amiga. Normally the cables are like bent into the correct position. So when you put the floppy drive on there, the existing cables just sort of fall into the right spot. Since we don't have those cables, I had to reference a picture and I just did a quick Google and I found this one. So it looks like the red stripe is over on the left and the red wire on the floppy power cable is also on the left. And looking here, I actually hooked up the cable incorrectly. So I'll just take that off. And with the power cable, the red wire goes on the left. If you have the ribbon cable on backwards, there's not a big deal. It actually just turns the floppy drive on all the time. If the power cable's on backwards, and it's not gonna go backwards on this side, because here it actually has a little plastic thing it connects up to, but if I had it wrong on the motherboard, it would send 12 volts into the five volt circuit on this, and that would be very bad. And you know what? I just looked at another picture before I powered anything on, and I'm glad I did, because on this picture, the red wire on the motherboard connection is on the right. And with reversing this cable, that now matches. So red towards the back of the machine, and the red towards the right. The stripe was also reversed on that picture, but it doesn't matter as long as it's reversed on both ends, we're totally fine. So really, hats off to you, Commodore, for putting a power connector on the motherboard that is not keyed, where you can accidentally send 12 volts into the disk drive. With the floppy drive off to its side, let's power this on and let's hope we don't blow up the disk drive. It sounded like it worked, it moved the heads. That's a good sign and I hear it clicking. So I'm gonna take my cleaning floppy here. I'm gonna put some IPA into it. Let's stick this into the disk drive here and hope that it sounds normal. It's spinning. Um, it didn't really access more than a second though. I'm surprised it's not trying to access the floppy. Like the logo should disappear as it tries to boot. It's not really doing that. Well, hopefully that little bit of cleaning that it did there was enough. I'm gonna stick this bad floppy disk in here and let's see if that does anything. No. The expectation is as soon as you put the disk in the drive, the logo should disappear as the computer tries to boot from it. It's gonna fail because this is not an Amiga boot disk. The disk drive is clicking, which is very typical for the Amiga as it tries to detect if a disk is inserted, but it's not doing anything. Now we could be dealing with a couple different issues here. There could be a problem with the cable. There could be a problem with the drive. There could be a problem with the 8220 here or the 8520 detecting that the disc is in the drive. There's a plethora of issues that could be happening. Let's try to rule a few things out. This is an external floppy drive from an Amiga 1000, but I've 3D printed this front bezel here and there's a GoTech in here. And in here are a bunch of Amiga pieces of software and we can just plug this into the Amiga 500. And with Kickstart 1.3, it should try to boot from this externally. This external floppy drive just connects right here to the computer. I'll just leave the internal one connected just as it was. Power the machine on. And there we go, I just inserted the Amiga test kit disc and it doesn't appear to be tempting to boot. Now, and what I don't fully remember is if Kickstart 1.3, which is what's in here, does attempt to boot the external floppy drive or not. So the best thing to do is power off the computer and let's swap these two chips here because they are the same. So hopefully if there's a fault on that chip, then swapping these two around should make it work or at least change the symptoms. And if the chip that was in there, which I should mark before I put it in, let's put F for floppy on that one. And on the other chip, the one that was in this socket, I wrote an A for, well, I don't know, no reason, A for Adrian, let's just say. Pop that in there and let's power the computer on and let's see if that makes any difference whatsoever. So the disc here is, nope, that is not trying to boot. 
But with the floppy drive connected up, let's power this back on. Hey, there we go. It's freaking booting. Yes, Amiga test kit, version 1.11. We are up and operational. Okay, I need to swap back these chips here though and see if that problem returns. Maybe there was just bad contact in the socket, like a little deoxid would have worked. Oops, I don't know why I'm not just using my chip lifter here. Okay, okay, so this was the F1, right, that I took out. It does appear to have some bent pins and I don't think I just caused that. I'm gonna try to straighten the legs a little bit in this 3D printed leg straightener. Alrighty, the F chip is back in the F socket. Now let's put the A1 back in the A socket, power on the computer. Let's see if we get Amiga test kit. If not, that chip is bad. We do not. And the disk drive is clicking. So that definitely tells us right away that this chip here is bad. And just to double check, we're gonna reverse these again. Let's see if we get a working system. Obviously there's a fault in this chip here. And yeah, the disk drive is booting, maybe. Oh yeah, okay, it booted up. It just booted very quickly. All right, we've identified our first fault and that's this bad chip here. So I'm gonna go into my stock and I'm trying to find a spare one of these so we can get this machine running and we can do some further tests with the Amiga test kit. All right, it's been a few hours. I actually went to have dinner and the system appears to still be running here. I just left it on. A little bit of the deoxid has moved around on the Agnes chip there. I went and grabbed another CIA from spare parts and I tried to take the metal hoods off of these connectors that were on my scrap motherboard and I couldn't get them off. So I just desoldered the entire connectors and I guess um, I'll swap them out on here. So first things first, let's put in the 8520 here that I got from spare parts. Let's take this one out. In fact, I'm gonna put the A1 back on that side so we can put the new replacement part on the floppy drive side. All right, there we go, it is in. Let's turn this on for some testing. Just make sure the notches are in the right orientation. Over to the right, they are. Let's see if this thing boots up now. No, it's doing exactly the same thing it was before. That's very surprising. Well, part of me has me wondering if there's a problem with the socket more than anything else. This chip is in good shape. There's no issues here with any of the pins. So even though I'm just about out of deoxid, Let's put deoxid in this socket. All right, let's pop the bad one back in, the bad one. Let's see what happens. Are you gonna work? No. So let's go back to the parts one here. I mean, I don't know if this parts one is working, but it just seems so unusual and improbable that it's bad in exactly the same way. What the, whoa, what the heck is going on here? Put the disc in there, nothing? Come on. All right, I'm gonna put the A1 back in the socket that was seemingly working. And we'll put the bad one in the other socket and power on the system. Let's just make sure it's still booting. It's freaking booting. All right, well, this is the 8520 that didn't work as well. Here's the other one from my spare parts. Right, let's pop that in the board. I still have the bad one over here on the left socket. So it's booting. Um, okay, so I have an idea. I'm wondering if this A1, no, what could be going on here? If I put this A1 back over here in this socket and it prevents the system from booting, then somehow the A1 could be bad. I, I maybe, maybe, and having it in the motherboard over in this socket somehow prevents it from working. Okay, let's see what happens here. Because this was the commonality. Yeah, what? Okay, we're gonna have to go to the schematics at this point, because I don't actually understand what's going on. But this is the one that's definitely bad. So I'm getting my marker here, so we can mark this with an X. Okay, what we're looking at here are the schematics for the revision six, but I think things are basically the same. So on the schematic, we can see U7, which is this one right here, so on the left, and we can see U8, which is this one here on the right. And we can see that U8 is connected to some of the floppy drive signals here. We have motor on signal and some other select stuff. But if we look at U7, also some of the floppy signals go to that one. 
So that actually kind of threw me for a loop. I assumed it was the one on the right that's right next to the floppy connector did all the floppy connector stuff, but that is not the case. So we know for sure that the A1, which I had over here on the left originally, is bad. And it could well be like the track zero signal here or the change signal. Okay, so that's pin four on this chip on the left. And if we look at pin four on the one on the right, let's look at what pin four goes to. Ah, look at that, it goes to the parallel port and we weren't even testing the parallel port. So that signal being bad, it's inconsequential if you're not using the parallel port. So as Dave Jones would say, that's a little bit of a trap for young players there and just swapping them around made the disk drive work. But the reality was it was actually masking the problem of this bad chip here, this A chip. So I went ahead and I put the F chip back in here. That was the one that was originally over here on the right. It's over here on the left. Let's just get that X off of there. In fact, I'll just take all the marks right off of it. Oh, look at that. Because this chip is actually good. Let's clean up the mess I made. And with the bad chip in hand, this is the one I got out of my spare parts. Let's just power the machine up again. And of course we know it's all gonna boot up at this point. Everything is the right direction. And there we go. It's actually booting. Even better is that the floppy drive appears to be working. I think the next thing to do before I go ahead and desolder these connections here, let's plug a mouse and let's plug a keyboard into this thing. In fact, let's plug sound into this as well. Let's just test if everything is working here. So the keyboard connection is right here on the motherboard. And once again, I have no idea how to plug the keyboard in. Typically when the keyboard is sitting in the case, fully assembled, the wire has like some memory and it's very easy to connect up. But in this case, I don't know. I'm thinking it goes this way here with the black wire to the left, but over to the Google so I can look at some pictures. Oh, I love the Google images search there. It's like, oh, you have a blank wire where there's no signal and that's the way you plug it in. Except this connector here does not have a blank wire. It has the yellow wire that is missing in the freaking picture. What I can see looking through several pictures is the black wire does always appear to be on the left. So there it is black and orange, or I guess it was black and brown, even with this original picture with the missing hole or the missing wire. Now I do notice in this photograph, there's actually a little dot right there and you can see there's a one on the motherboard and looking at this connector, it has the dot as well. So that pretty much confirms that is the correct way to plug it in. For using this computer, I'm just gonna put down a little mouse pad here under the keyboard and carefully balance the keyboard here. Okay, so it's resting on the desk over on the right side. You can't see it, but it's down here on the desk and this part is just floating. So we should be good to go. And I went ahead and plugged in a mouse. I think it's the connector on the right. I plugged in the audio, the keyboard is ready to go. Let's power this thing up. Uh, it's off camera, but there is a power LED and the floppy LED is on. And look at this, my friends, we have mouse activity. Let's go right to audio. Yes, we have sound. Let's turn the speaker up. It's like a 16-bit dance party here, I guess. All channels off and on. Low-pass filters working. Uh, let's hear the main part of the beat. That's what I want to hear. So you can turn these off and on one at a time. Spice it up by Jester. Thanks, Jester, for this. All right, keyboard, escape. Whoa, that actually worked. All right, so F2 for keyboard. Let's see what's working and what's not. Keyboard's not working super great. We're missing the left shift key. We're missing the zero on the number pad. The three keys on the top and the help key all don't work. In fact, uh, somehow pushing the help key made the space. Okay, that's not good. What's happening here? If I flex this, ooh, getting all sorts of random stuff happening on here. Not good. Now it's not doing it, but we must have some kind of dirt inside the membrane. Uh, so probably what I'm gonna have to do is take all those screws out and we're gonna have to <laughs> take a look inside this keyboard. In fact, take a look at this. We're getting a flashing code on the keyboard. So I think something has gone totally wrong on this keyboard, unfortunately. What I can do is power cycle the computer here and that flashing code has gone away. So we do have functional keys again. The keys that weren't working though are still not working. Okay, 
So that was transient. Me twisting it just, I don't know, gave the controller some unhappy signals. Uh, I just noticed poking around, we got three blinking on the caps lock key. So this is a unhappy keyboard, very unhappy. I just rebooted the system again to get the keyboard working again. I'm gonna quickly go through these other tests just to make sure this machine is as functional as I think it is. I'm just testing the floppy drive. I'm testing the second floppy drive, my external one, the GoTech, and I think it's working okay. <laughs> it does say the ready was too fast, GoTech or hacked PC drive, but I can hear it clicking away as it reads these tracks and I don't know whatever disks in here. I think the test kit disk and it's obviously reading correctly. The CIA timer test passed perfectly. And I don't have the serial or parallel port dongles, so I can't do any of that testing. But to be honest, I haven't used a serial port or a parallel port on Amiga in a very long time. All right, so after replacing that one chip, this Amiga 500 appears to be working well. I think my next step is I'm gonna swap out those ports so that we have proper hooded connectors and not just those bare pins. Okay, there we go. Connectors have been replaced, and these ones here, not useful anymore. Let's try to take the back cover off this keyboard. Let's see if I can see anything that's obviously wrong with it. I must say that keyboard repair is one of my least favorite things to do with these retro computers, especially ones like this with the membrane because they are just so darn fiddly. Now, when I talk about membrane, with the way this looks underneath, it's a Mitsumi made keyboard. There's their sticker right there. Essentially, if you think about the Commodore 64, it has a PCB that's on the back here, and the plungers that are on each key have these little carbon impregnated rubber pads which make contact with the PCB, and it closes the circuit, which on the Commodore 64 goes back to the motherboard and tells it that you pushed a key. This has a keyboard controller right here, and it communicates over our serial line to the machine. Now on these keyboards, the way it works is a bit different. It has this metal backplate, and on top of it is a mylar membrane, and the membrane is fixed in position, and it has little contact pads on it and a bunch of traces and stuff like that. And what happens when you push on the keys, the plunger goes down and it has the carbon impregnated rubber, just like on the 64, and it pushes down onto the mylar membrane. Well, what can happen is the membrane, if a little bit of water gets in there, it can corrode, you can lose some of the traces, and being plastic, it's really difficult to fix. Also, of course, dirt can get in there and junk and stuff, and that can cause things to work. Now, usually if it's dirt or a little bit of crust on those rubber pads, when you push the key a bunch of times, it might register. This thing didn't register at all when I pushed those keys. That kind of leads me to believe that maybe there's a problem with the controller on here. Maybe there's a problem with the connection on this little PCB from the Mylar PCB. Now what can help, and I should have looked it up, and maybe it exists, is a keyboard matrix for the Mitsubi keyboard. And it would kind of explain how all the various keys connect back to the controller, which would give us an indication, like for instance, that shift key that wasn't working, maybe that key's on its own. It doesn't share any rows or columns with any of the other keys. The ones over on this side, the, the number pads, ones that weren't working, maybe those are all together and they share like a, a row or a column or probably a column goes this way. And this thing is already wanting to kind of come apart now. Now, if we look here, this is what I'm talking about. See how this is coming up off now, the, uh, the keys and this black plastic here. So I do need to make sure that I got every single little screw out and I did. This PCB is not moving and I'm wondering if it's, stuck down with adhesive. Oh, there's a bunch of glue there. That could be the problem right there. In fact, I think that's exactly what this is. This whole thing is free now, including there, except for right there where it's glued on. This glue, no, no. And I have to be careful here. I don't want to use acetone. Oh, there we go. Okay, it came free. So let's lift this up carefully. So that's the Mylar membrane that I was talking about, which is like the PCB on the Commodore 64. To be honest, I don't know why they use this other than like to save money or whatever. I could definitely see a bunch of gunk in here. So there's like dirt and stuff that have fallen down on here. So a good cleaning may, may improve things a little bit. Now I had to repair one of these Mylar membranes before on another Amiga 500. And what happened is there was a bit of corrosion 
like in one of these traces here and it was in the middle of the plastic so there was no way I could replace it. So what I did is I took a little bit of copper tape and I recreated the trace between two of these little pads right here. And these are conductive, these little black pads. So I put the copper cross and like that and that actually repaired the keyboard. It, it reconnected those two pads. I don't remember which two it was. It was like something over in this area, but that's what I ended up doing because the, like I said, the corrosion was in between or under the plastic membrane. So now that this thing is out, we can flip this over and this is what I'm talking about. These are the little conductive pads that are on here and they look exactly like the ones on the 64. You see the way it's shaped? It's like a little cup. So it's actually what pushes on those two black pads um, is the two raised areas. Well, when I flip this over, that's what's raised. Now, one thing about this whole thing that is kind of cool is you can wash this as a complete unit. So we could take this upstairs in the sink and I can just completely put soap and water and a brush and just clean the heck out of this thing as is. And as long as it's fully dry before you put it back together, you shouldn't have a problem with the membrane here. Now, as for the membrane here, it's very delicate and I do want to clean it because it's got a bunch of junk on there. I can see like bits of debris and stuff. So I'm just going to spray a little Windex, which may not be the right thing, onto a little cloth here. Just make sure that it's not too wet. I'm just going to very gently wipe this thing. And yeah, a bunch of stuff is coming off there. Just, just a little bit, but it's on there. So this shift key right here, that's the shift key. It was not working. And there is a trace that goes from here to there. So that key was working. So we know that that's not a problem. So the other pad here, the one that's closer to the keyboard controller, it's got a little bit of wear on it, as do a lot of these over here, but they were working. So I'm gonna try to carefully trace this. What I'm trying to do is figure out if this is making its way. So it goes around here. If this goes directly to the controller or not. Again, this has to do with the keyboard matrix. Oh, and it's just, it's so hard to tell. Okay, time to Google. And a quick Google, and here's the matrix. Looks like someone created it here, no cash, back in 2016. This MOS 6570 is the keyboard controller that's on the keyboard itself. And what we're looking at here are rows and columns. So this is the column here, and there's the row. So help key was one that wasn't working, but F10 did work, and the up arrow key also worked. So that implies that the problem actually exists on the pads itself for the help key, for instance. Also, the number zero key was one that wasn't working, but the backspace key was working and like the enter key was working as well. So that means this column is fine and the row is fine. What I don't see are the shift keys, but you know what? Here they are, right shift, left shift. These are direct shots right into the keyboard controller. So the only way to really proceed now is to plug this thing into the working system and poke around on here and try to figure out what's going on. So I have everything reconnected here. Let's hope the system still works after doing all that re-soldering of those connectors. I was manhandling the board a little bit. It's booting, so it's working, it's working. Okay, so as you can see, we have some working keys. It seems like this keyboard is not happy if you power it up with this entire thing removed. And it might be because the caps lock key has an LED that pushes down onto the board. I don't quite know. Look, I got stuck there. But we're definitely having some issues here. It's like I just bent the board a little bit and all of a sudden all these keys are like pushed down and we lift this off because it was just sitting on there. There's no reason why the keyboard controller thinks those keys are pushed at this point but it is sort of working and we're in the same situation we were before where the top row of the number pad is not working. Okay, so I'm gonna carefully lift this off and then I'm gonna push on some keys with the wire here. <laughs> and let's see like if help works, for instance. No, help is not working. Okay, so with the wire, I am able to push keys. So I'm pushing that asterisk key there but the key right next to it absolutely is not working. So we definitely have a bad trace or some bad contact on the help, the two parentheses and the forward slash along the numeric keypad there. And here's the multimeter. We should be able to see some continuity here between various contacts. So for instance, here to here, that has continuity here to here, that's good. And then from this key, which is not working, the trace goes somewhere far, far away. 
and it looks like the help key plus these three they loop around here and according to that that web page i found it looks like looks like these f keys are what it's shared with f6 7 8 9 10 which makes its way down here to this bridge here and then it goes up there I think it's this bridge trace here that comes down and it's super around about over here. I'm pretty sure that's the trace there that makes its way up there. So there must be a problem between these four keys here and with one of these uh, connections here, these bridges here that make their way to there. And actually, I think I see the problem right there. See this? This is the trace here that makes its way from these top keys over to the F key. That looks like a little bit of corrosion inside the Mylar sheet. And with it flipped over, doesn't look like it's disconnected, but obviously that is. There's also a little bit of corrosion right there in that trace, plus some over here as well. I think some water kind of got into this keyboard at some point. I did a quick Google and it does appear there's actually a replacement membrane for the Amiga 500 and potentially the 4000 and 4000 tower. It says the Amiga 500 membrane works with keyboards assembled with Mitsumi membrane part number 56A619A and B. And I can see on this membrane here, we're talking about the 619A. And it looks like Sell My Retro also has one for 25 pounds. And adding one of the membranes to the cart and looking at the total, it's about $40 US shipped, including tax, which is a bit odd. We don't have tax where I live in Oregon, but um, I guess this website charges it anyways. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and order one of these membranes, but for now, I'm just gonna put this keyboard back together. Well, I guess I'm gonna give it a little bit of a clean first in the sink upstairs, and then we'll put it back together, and I'll have to do the membrane swap at a future time because it's probably gonna take a few weeks to get to me here in the US, and I'd like to get this video finished up. It's the next day, and the keyboard is back together and looking much, much cleaner. I did preserve the price tag sticker because I thought that's a little cool piece of history, but you notice no more dirt. Now the keyboard works sometimes, and uh, there we go. It looks like it is locked up. I don't know what's going on exactly. The computer is not locked up, as you can see. Oh, I've switched to an RGB capture, which is why it's in color now. I don't get what's going on. There's something weird happening with the keyboard. Right now we have just a frozen light. We power cycle this. The keyboard does work. It seems to work as well as it did yesterday, but then we're still getting random flash code sometimes on the caps lock key. In fact, that's not good. It's uh, those lights are working, but that's clearly not working. I think there's a problem with this keyboard controller, to be honest. So earlier off camera, when I put the keyboard back together and I was testing it, I was getting, sometimes it would work. Sometimes I would get two flash codes here on the caps lock. Sometimes I would get three flashes on the caps lock. And we saw that yesterday as well. And a quick search on the internet reveals some flash codes here. So one flash is a ROM or two flashes is RAM internal to the keyboard processor. And three flashes is a watchdog timer problem. Well, this is the keyboard processor here. And if there's a problem inside of there, really not much we can do to try to fix it. Now, to rule out any possible issues here on the motherboard, I went and grabbed another keyboard here. This is one that actually works. And let's just make sure that this thing actually is working. This is a different type of keyboard though. As you can see here, the way the membrane connects up, not the same. So it doesn't have that same membrane in there. I had to do a repair on this one because the membrane also had corrosion issues, but I think my repair was actually successful. Let's see what happens when we turn this on. All right, and the caps lock key is not on. And okay, yeah, we're actually working. I recall the repair I had to do on this keyboard was like up here, I think like the escape key wasn't working. And I did use a little bit of that copper tape and I don't remember exactly what I did, some glue, I think, and that actually fixed it. So yeah, okay, so everything is working on this keyboard. Definitely the other keyboard is having an issue. <laughs> so let's switch back to that one. And when we look at the back of this thing, there doesn't appear to be any issues, but maybe there's a little bit of corrosion on that keyboard controller chip. So perhaps I should just reflow those solder joints. I don't have all of the screws in. I just have a few in the middle, some on the right and some on the left, plus all the ones on the PCB in the board. I think that's all you really need for this to work. And I'm just gonna reflow all the pins on the IC here. Hopefully, I mean, I'm not holding out hope to be honest, but you never know. 
This could help the situation. And let's turn this on, watch the caps lock key. Okay, it flashed. That's a good sign. That means it's not in error right now. F2, oh, look at that. All right, okay. Well, that's not gonna fix the problem with the keys out not working. Uh, here's the help key, these keys on the top, same problem. But for now, this is actually working. Mm. Let's do the old twist test here. This is what was causing it to kind of mess up before. So maybe that was a bad solder joint on there. Yeah, maybe. Anyways, it definitely appears what didn't work before still doesn't work, but what did work before absolutely does work now. I wonder if there was a problem over here on the controller with like the ground or the five volts going to these ICs and it would glitch sometimes, which would cause those errors like RAM error or ROM error on the controller chip. But for now, we are looking good. All right, so the motherboard is working properly after we replace this bad chip here. The floppy drive is working properly. The keyboard seems to be working as good as it works. Let's test out this mouse here. And I'm just gonna open up another Amiga mouse and try to plug the cable in. Hopefully it's the same connector. And then at least I can test to see if uh, this circuit board is working. It's definitely not identical. And the wire colors are not the same either. So I don't really know if this is safe to just um, plug in. And I thought it was the same connector, but look again, it actually has an additional pin. So that is not going to work. So I think for this mouse, other than it being um, really dusty in here, uh, let's just make the assumption that it does work. And if ever I find a cable that could replace this one, then I'll have an extra PCB for an Amiga mouse. I am noticing the rollers are actually pretty clean. I'm not seeing a lot of that buildup on them. So that's kind of nice. All right, I booted up Rainbow Island here. Let's just see if this thing can actually run some software beyond the diagnostics. I think the audio is working. This is a PAL game though, so it may not actually work properly. And this is an OCS machine, so I can't even switch it into PAL mode. I have my uh, joystick or you know NES gamepad connected up, by the way. So it's loading, <laughs> the graphics are corrupted. Please ignore that. Yep, the flashing. Yeah, this is all because it's PAL. Why don't we try loading Amiga Workbench 1.3, which is actually what should run on this computer. Now, without a RAM expansion card, this computer doesn't have a ton of capabilities. It's 512K. It's able to run those disk boot games like uh, the one we were just running. But running Workbench here, which does appear to be working, there won't be a ton of memory available to actually run some other programs unless it takes over the entire computer. Okay, Workbench 1.3 is in the floppy drive. This DF1 is my floppy emulator, which is still connected here. Let's change to a different disk. I just put in Arkanoid, and I have no idea if Arkanoid can actually run from Workbench here. Let's see, this might be a bootable disk. Oh, and you can see 340-ish K available. And that's because, of course, we don't have the RAM card in here. All right, so this showed up with, well, nothing on here, which means that this is a bootable disk. And the only way we can actually boot this with Kickstart 1.3 is if I copy the disk that's on here onto a real floppy disk. I just swapped the emulator over to sysinfo, and I think this should work. Incidentally, if you're noticing like a little bit of pixel imperfection here, and that's because the scan converter I'm using is just not set up for the Amiga. If it's not set up exactly, we're not getting a pixel perfect representation. So some of the, the pixels look a little weird sized and stuff like that. All right, here we go, sysinfo. So if we go speed, we should be getting, well, I don't know, actually, we should be getting 1.04 versus the A600. I mean, it's really margin of error, I think. But notice here on the B2000, which is the same as the Amiga 2000, it's getting 0.73. So this machine is only 0.73 times as fast as that. And that's because the Amiga 2000 has fast memory on the motherboard. So when you run a program like sysinfo, the program itself is running inside of the fast memory and probably some of the workbench as well. And that just means there's less contention between the software that's running and the chip memory, which is used for graphics display and stuff like that. I am noticing over here though, it says that the Denise is the ECS or enhanced chipset. I didn't even bother looking at the part number on there to see if that's actually accurate. Here's the Denise chip. It's an 8362R8. And unfortunately, sysinfo was wrong. 8362R8 is an OCS Denise. The Super Denise, also known as the enhanced chipset Denise is an 8373R4. So that program is just wrong.
Now on the Amiga 500 with Kickstart 1.3 to boot the external floppy emulator, you have to do a little mod on the motherboard to basically swap around, well, it's actually underneath the chip here, to swap around the drive selects. You have to swap drive select zero and one around. Since I don't feel like doing that, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna try running xcopy. Hopefully this actually works. This is a disk copy utility. And then we can just copy one of the disks like Arkanoid off of the emulator here onto a real floppy disk. So in xcopy here, the source drive is gonna be drive one and the destination drive is gonna be drive zero, which is the actual internal floppy drive, well, the one that's connected to the ribbon cable here. I've gone ahead and I've swapped the disk out and we'll just hit start. And here it goes, it's actually copying the disk. You may remember this tool from back in the day. If you had an Amiga and you were copying games from friends and stuff, this was a pretty common program for doing that exact thing. All right, operation done. All right, so we should be able to boot this game now. So control Amiga Amiga reboots the computer. It's like control alt delete. Let's see what happens. All right, look at the cursor there. A, oh, this actually has a couple different things on here. Interesting. So do I push A, enter? I guess there was a little bit of extra room on the floppy disk, so they added whatever execute Amigas is and the crystal hammer. Maybe those were intros. All right, there's a little intro demo. There's actually no music, which is a bit surprising. Ooh, yeah, decompressing, decrunching, I think it was called. Here it is, the original version of Arkanoid, which is why I wanted to try this game. I figured it would work perfectly on this 512K machine. There we go. Oh, look how smooth that is. Ooh, the laser. Ah, I didn't want to get that pill and it gave it to me anyways and then I died because I was being greedy. Ah. Oh. <laughs> I think that's it, game over. <laughs> I'm terrible at this game. Okay, well, I think for sure I've confirmed that this Amiga 500 is working perfectly. Workbench works, games work, music is working, and uh, the keyboard appears to be functioning properly as well. So I just had to reflow those connections on the bottom here. Has anyone ever run into that problem before? I hadn't worked on that many Amiga 500s where I've seen that particular issue, but it just seemed weird. As I remember early on when I twisted the keyboard and then it just started malfunctioning, that screams that we have a bad connection of some kind on that little PCB. All that's left for us to test now is this SCSI card here for the Amiga 2000. So I'm gonna move the Amiga 500 off the bench here and grab my 2000, and then we'll see if that card is working. Alrighty, here is my Amiga 2000, and this thing, well, it's battery ravaged. This is the one where I'm pretty sure I have to wedge something between the motherboard and the drive cage here to actually get the computer to work, and that's because there's a whole bunch of trace damage on the motherboard, and I've tried to clean it and fix like a ton of bodge wires, but it doesn't really work. In here, we have an accelerator. This is a Commodore 68030 accelerator. I do have an A2091, so this is a SCSI card, sort of the equivalent of this GVP one we're gonna test here, but the Commodore one, and it takes dip memory, which you can't really see because it's off the camera. I can't go any wider with this bench camera. And then we have this, which is a bridge board. I think it's a 286 version. I'm gonna remove this for testing the eight megabytes on this card, and that's because the Zorro 2 auto configure memory, if I recall, you cannot have eight megabytes on the Zorro slots, including the bridge board, because this needs like a megabyte of that memory. So let's power this up. I just wanna make sure everything is working. It's coming to life, and we have just a black screen. Is this actually connected? Yes, the video cable is connected. I don't wanna make this an Amiga 2000 troubleshooting video, all right, let's just let it sit for a second here. I got the usual flash on the power LED. All right, I got this thing to actually give us this screen. I forgot about this other weird idiosyncrasy this machine has. When you power it on, you have to hook the keyboard up and then hit Control Amiga Amiga, do a, like a soft reset, and then the thing starts to boot. Okay, so for the GVP card, I populated with eight megabytes of RAM. I mounted the hard drive on it that was on the controller that was in this machine. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I say the cable's not plugged in because I saw this, but it is plugged in. There are just two connectors on there. I think this came out of an Apple, an old Macintosh or something like that. I think I've configured the jumpers correctly for eight megabytes. Let's see if this thing works. Well, let's see if the Amiga is even working. Let's see if this card works in the Amiga. Okay, the system is booting. I don't even have the keyboard connected, so that's a good thing. Oh, I should plug in the hard drive LED. Oh, I think it's booting. Yes, it is actually booting. 
Look at this, everyone. Look at this. I think I have some utilities in here, like sys info. Uh, the RAM is not working properly. Oh, so this machine has two megabytes of chip memory. I must have a little like upgrade board in there. Okay, here's sys info. Let's take a look at what this shows. All right, so we have four megabytes of RAM here, two megabytes of chip, and that's it. Now, the thing is, I think this accelerator card has four megs of memory, it's right there. It may be configured to overlap with the Zorro memory, so I may just need to take the accelerator out and uh, try again. Before I do that though, here's the accelerator board, four megabytes, and then the GVP Series 2 SCSI 64K, and then the memory board here, which is also the GVP card, has zero K. So maybe I have the jumpers misconfigured. I've removed all the cards from the Amiga 2000, except for the GVP card, and I think we are good to go. There we go, we have eight megs of fast memory, and we have the same two megabytes of chip memory. And looking right here where it starts at 200000, that's the same exact address that the RAM started here on this accelerator card. So that's why they weren't working together, they're overlapping. In the Amiga test kit, let's just do a quick RAM test here. So it says 10 megabytes of total memory. Let's begin the test. So the RAM test on this utility isn't too bad. It does a random fill, it does some checkerboard tests, it does not do a March test though. So it's not the best possible test, but it's also pretty decent. So it's doing a random fill. Oh, it actually just found some bad memory. Okay, so there's a feature to test custom ranges. Let's start this out. Okay, we know it started okay at the beginning of the test. So this I think is the megabyte of RAM that's not working. We hit F1 and let's see what happens. Okay, yeah, we're getting the same error there. And what we can do is we can edit these memory ranges to try to figure out exactly where the bad memory is on this memory card. Okay, so that megabyte is bad as well. And we're testing the 800,000 address here, which I think is the seventh megabyte on the card. Oh, that, that's working, it's already on the checkerboard now. And if we test the eighth megabyte, the top memory on the card, it fails on random fill. Oh, checkerboard, okay. So it seems like the two megabytes that are bad are five and six, because seven and eight are okay. Now, when we look at the memory on here, these are eight bit SIMs. So you need two of these for 16 bit, which is what this card is, which is why two of them together are showing up as bad. The manual for this card, which I have up on the screen, talks about how to populate these memory modules. And if you're gonna install two megabytes of memory, you start with these two modules right here, 10 and 11. So megabytes one and two are these two, three and four are these, five and six, seven and eight. Seems like these two modules here are the ones that are problematic. Take a look at this. And if I can get this to focus, the problem is evident right there. I don't have that module plugged in the board all the way. These SIM slots are a little weird. You actually just push the SIM straight into them. You don't have to like tilt them in. So I think that was the problem right there. We're just running the whole 10 megabyte RAM check again. The memory I installed in this, by the way, was stuff that I had pre-tested on the RAM check. It was sitting on the bench here for maybe a year, so it could have gone bad, but I have a feeling the only problem we were experiencing is the fact that I didn't have that module plugged in all the way. Oh no! Okay, well notice we have a little bit of a difference though. So we're talking about 16-bit memory, so that module is now working because those dashes imply that the bits are correct. But this one here, which is the other one, the one I didn't push down, is still incorrect. So let me just power this off and double check that I plugged both of them in correctly. All right, and I double checked that that memory was seated properly in there, both of those SIMs, and we're still getting a problem there on uh, address lines 15 through eight. I just swapped out a SIM that I think is the problem. Let's see if that works now. I did notice that the memory modules that I put in there, the one that maybe is, oh, it's working, okay. Interesting, so, oh no. All righty, so it passed one, that's why it says 1.2 now. So it went through one of the checks and now it failed on that first memory module again, the other one I didn't take out. Now I just noticed that these are four megabyte modules and this doesn't support four meg modules. That shouldn't matter, it should just use these as one meg modules, but I have a feeling the problem is it's just not really compatible with these. So I think what I need to do is take out these four meg modules and just put one meg modules in here and try again. All righty, I swapped out all those four meg modules here we go, it's testing that part of the memory right now. I think we're good. It's already run through a whole pass of checkerboard one and the random fill. Now it's doing checkerboard two. Once it gets to 2.0 on this round here, that means it's done an entire pass of the memory check. And I think we're nearly there. There we go. We are on random fill. It has gone through a full pass, which means all the memory on this SCSI card is working. Well, there we have it. 
the $2 deconstructed Amiga 500 is fully functional. Of course, the keyboard does need that new membrane still, but I'm sure once I swap that out, everything will work great on that. And the Zoro 2 card, well, as you just saw, that is working great. And the reality is, there was nothing wrong with any of this stuff except for this one chip that was on the 500's motherboard there. Otherwise, this thing worked. So I have to wonder when it was retired, was it because of that bad chip? You couldn't boot the system and the person just got angry and deconstructed it? Or was it really that Amigas at the time just had no value when they took this thing apart, so they put it up on a corkboard as a little cool wall art project and called it a day? I know I alluded to a purpose for these Amiga 500 parts, and there will be a purpose. I will be using these for an upcoming project, so keep your eyes peeled for that. I think it should be a pretty interesting one. Get subscribed, of course, so you get notified when I upload that. A huge thanks to Bill for donating this stuff for me. I remember Bill telling me that he had had this stuff for a good while. It wasn't like he just found this the other day for $2. So Bill, if you're watching this, comment down below and let people know how long you were actually holding onto this stuff in your house before you decided you weren't gonna use it and you thought you would give it to me. And now it's just the usual YouTube outro stuff. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling on the side of the screen. They make it possible I do this full time. So huge thank you to them. It means so much to me. If you wanna become a patron, you can do so. The link in the description below. Hit that thumbs up if you liked the video. Thumbs down if you didn't. You know, all the usual YouTube stuff. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. And I'll see you next time. Bye.